Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. W.F. Strong, and I want to uh, thank our underwriter, audiobooks.com, who makes this program uh, possible. Audiobooks.com has 40,000 book titles, many of them top bestsellers, 40,000 titles, and your first one's free. So you better, 40,000 titles, you better get started. You got a lot of listening to do. Our book today is a wonderful book called Why Science Does Not Disprove God. It is written by Amir Axel, who is a PhD who received graduate degrees in mathematics from the University of California at Berkeley and the University of Oregon, Paradise in the Rain, some people call that. Uh, He is the author of the acclaimed Fermat's Last Theorem, which has been published in 28 languages. He has been nominated, or that book was nominated for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and he has received a Simon Guggenheim, excuse me, Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship. That's quite a lot to say, uh, a Sloan Foundation grant, and he's known as a uh, science journalist. He's currently uh, a research fellow at the History of Science program at Boston University. He's written for the Wall Street Journal, Scientific American, uh, New York Times, etc. A distinguished author for sure. And uh, we're very happy to have him. Dr. Excel, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Great to be on the show. Thank you. Well, I I want to tell you that you've achieved something uh, rare. Uh, You have written essentially a a science book, and yet you're number one in religion, at least on um, Amazon at the moment. Uh, that's that's quite a cool thing, I think. Well, I, I try to explain in the book that religion and science had the same uh, origin in trying to understand this mystery of life and death and uh, and and this universe that we live in. They're really um, after the same truths. So um, that's maybe <laughs> the point of connection between them. So. Uh, uh, allowing me to to do both in a sense. So, what has been the response uh, that you've received so far from, um, you might say, the uh, the atheists who are uh, represented most commonly by uh, Richard Dawkins and the late Christopher Hitchens? I've seen in reading reviews that some people say, "Well, your argument uh, is." Um, moot, really, because science does not try to disprove God. Well, that, that uh, I, I've seen that argument, too, and I argue against it, because <laughs> these atheists are actually telling us that God is unnecessary, mm-hmm. and, and that, God, that science proves that there, there is no need for God, because we have the formulas. Here is how the universe arose. This is how nature works. There's no need for God. Mm -hmm. To me, that is so preposterous and really idiotic. And it's not that these are stupid people, um, these uh, atheists, scientific atheists. They they are just being um, uh, deceptive here. Um, Science hasn't disproven the existence of God in any shape or form. In fact, when I look at the equations and, and the mathematics needed to explain just one particle in in the universe. Um, there are pages and pages of equations, the standard model, the Lagrangian and, and uh, Lie groups, and so on. Very, very highly advanced mathematics to explain one particle. How how can you say that there is nothing behind it, and that there is no structure and intelligence that brought it about? Well, it's true. You know, you go to the Big Bang, and uh, I, I think any reasonable person uh, might accept the Big Bang, but then you say, what caused the Big Bang? Right, and that's why I think uh, there's a need for something beyond what we see. <clears throat> the Big Bang, which we can go, get close to with, uh, with new observations, especially the new mm-hmm. discovery, announced a, m- a month ago of gravitational waves. <clears throat> we know that the Big Bang, the Big Bang existed it happened, but um, to to say that there there's nothing preceding it is not true. Uh, there has to have been something called quantum foam that creates um, the universe. And um, to to me, there is a power of nature that's behind it. Uh, some choose to call it God. Mm-hmm. So you say there's nothing incompatible at all between uh, uh, let there be light and the Big Bang. 
Right. In fact, there's an interesting story, story that I have in the book that, um, well, if you take Genesis uh, at what it says, it says that the universe had a beginning. Uh, it didn't, it, it's written for primitive people 3,000 years ago, so it talks about six days and God rested on the seventh day and so on. Today, we can take that figuratively. What the book of Genesis says is that the universe had a beginning. And um, if you lived in 1917, Albert Einstein wrote an equation for the whole universe, his cosmological uh, equation, to describe the universe. And that equation forced the universe, the, the equation told Einstein that the universe has to either expand or contract. But he added something called the cosmological constant to make it static, because all the physicists and um, astronomers of the time believed that the universe has always been there. It wasn't the case that the universe was uh, emerged, was created, came about, uh, was spawned at a particular time. It always existed. Now, in 1929, um, 12 years after Einstein's cosmological equation was, was proposed, uh, Ed, Edwin Hubble in California at the Mount Wilson Observatory discovered the, the recession of, of the galaxies away from us, faraway galaxies, proving that the universe is expanding, and therefore, uh, through Lemaitre, who was, a, who was a priest, by the way, he was a Catholic priest by the name of Lemaitre, who was also a, a mathematician working at MIT, um, they expanded it backward to say that the universe had a beginning. So from 1917 to 1929, the best scientists in the world believed the universe has always been there. While scripture tells us that it was create the universe emerged at one point. So um, you don't always have to believe just science. Sometimes science can be wrong and uh, scripture can be right. So science is rarely settled. Right. Science is, a, is a really a, a uh, somebody who wrote a comment about what I wrote, said science is a work in progress, and mm -hmm. it's true. Um, actually, this was a review of my book in mm -hmm. the Washington Post uh, by Alan Lightman, who's a very good physicist and, um, and writer and, and novelist. So, uh, yes, science is a work in progress. Well, and, you know, uh, uh, we always learn new things. Now we know there was a Big Bang. <laughs> uh, Bertrand Russell, you know, the famous, the great atheist, he, he said, uh, someone once asked him, if you were to meet God, what would you say to him? You know, you would, first of all, be surprised there was one, but uh, what would you say to him? And he said, more evidence. I need more evidence. Uh, you know, you didn't leave a, a big trail. Uh, and yet some say that there would never be enough evidence for someone like uh, like that, who's, a, who's an agnostic or atheist, because no evidence is going to take them off of their philosophy. I think that... Uh Science at the uh, leading edge and, uh, and religion tend to be very similar because if you see what scientists are saying now, they're talking about Boltzmann brains. Uh, this is named after the, the Austrian physicist Boltzmann. Um, the Boltzmann brains are out there in space. To me, that's no different from angels or the mm -hmm. multiverse. Uh, there's infinitely many other universes. At that point, science really becomes speculation where, and, and a matter of faith, what you believe. If you believe that there's a multiverse rather than just one universe, the, the, you have to take it by faith and not, there's no evidence for other universes. Then faith and science become very much the same thing. I read recently that there are some guys, I think at Stanford, are trying to um, play around with the idea that uh, maybe we're in a matrix, and if you were in a matrix, how would you prove you're in a matrix? That the universe is essentially, uh, you know, something of intelligent design uh, along the lines of a matrix. That, that's a very interesting idea. I, I, I heard about it as well. There's actually an interview that Brian Green did uh, a while back with, um, with Richard Dawkins, and he asked him, what if we're all uh, created, we're, we're, we're a simulation created by another uh, more advanced civilization. So all our lives and everything is just, a, we're, we're a computer simulation played by <laughs> a civilization that created this computer code and computer um, animation that makes us live our lives. And we think we're real, but we aren't. We are just a computer animation. 
And that was an interesting question. I can't remember how he hesitated <laughs> a lot because, in a sense, it's a trap. You, 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 that that he he would be willing to believe that there's a superior civilization that's creating that's created us as computer, you know, avatars. But he wouldn't believe in a god that created us directly. So. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's and it really it goes to the, the your point that you made about this matrix is really it, it brings forward this uh, conflict between scientific speculation and and religion. You, some people are willing to believe that there's an advanced civilization and there are computers and so on because we know computers. Mm-hmm. We don't know God, so computers is something that speaks to us. Um, and and they are willing. Many are willing to believe that we are just um, avatars made by another civilization. <laughs> but it, to me, it's much easier to believe in a god, but uh, some form of a god. Well, and what do you believe? Well, it's hard for me to to really adhere to any um, organized religion because. I don't know that people really understand God the way uh, better than than I do, for example. Or, and religions have had problems over the centuries. Uh, you know, uh, the, the Inquisition and the Crusades, the Holocaust, nine one one, all kinds of uh, murders of people in the name of religion. Our God is right, and your God is wrong. So it's difficult for me to to believe at least co- to believe completely in any one religion mm-hmm. but i believe in 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 a more abstract god what i view as einstein's god is mm-hmm. einstein said he believed in the god of spinoza a <laughs> god w- who was the embodiment mm-hmm. of the laws of nature um that's more like what i i personally believe i like spinoza i i, I like his i don't know if i get this quite right but he said there are many ways to the light Right. Yes. He had a yeah. he had a gentle humanistic philosophy, I would say. Uh, and another one I wanted to to bring up was, uh, well, he's not a theologian, but Hume, David Hume, who uh, essentially said, and I just want to see what you what you do with this is, uh, he argued that the uh, burden of proof in any theological debate about God, the burden of proof is with the believer because he's claiming that which is miraculous. And then there have been those on the other side who say, no, the burden of proof is with the non-believer because most people are believers. <laughs> and, and so they're arguing uh, uh, the unusual, so the burden of proof is with them. So uh, since you just wrote a book on this, what do you think? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I know that the atheists, and especially Richard Dawkins believed that not only is the burden of proof on the believer, but um, the believer should be accorded no respect. And he gets into it in his book about giving no respect to believers. And I, I try to stay away from, from that uh, very aggressive atheistic approach to life. I, um, I think that the, the burden of proof uh, should well if, if you think of a trial and and you know you're trying to prove something a burden of proof is on you or on the other side or in a statistical analysis the burden of proof is uh, on on the research hypothesis rather than than the null hypothesis i i think that um no first of all nobody has come up with any proof one way or the other so while uh, atheists claim that religious people should should have the burden of proof on them. They haven't proven anything. So um, they, if they don't want to believe until we prove to them otherwise, that's their right. Uh, but they shouldn't really cram down our throats mm-hmm. science as as a reason for not believing, because I see absolutely nothing in modern science that tells me that there is no God. Science won against religion in the 19th century, against the literalist approach to Scripture, with the demise of the young earth hypothesis, you know, rocks mm-hmm. and, and geological processes prove that uh, what we know today is that the earth is 4.5 billion years old. Um, in the 19th century, they understood that already that it's much older than a few thousand, but they didn't know the actual age. Um, Neanderthal remains have been discovered during the 19th century all over Europe, showing that hominids that uh, predate 
humans and, and well the Neanderthals lived at the same time as modern humans but they are earlier in their evolution uh, lived and, and at least other hominids lived in Europe and that uh, that changes our thinking and uh, Leon Foucault in 1851 in Paris proved the rotation of the earth using um, Foucault's pendulum mm -hmm. so many literalist approaches to li literalist interpretations of scripture um, were, were completely disproven disproven in the 19th century but that doesn't mean that there is no god it means that if you take what you read in the bible very literally then that's not necessarily true well just because it says the sun rises and the sun sets doesn't mean that um, the earth is the center of the universe so things like that notions like that that are really corruptions of scripture have been completely debunked in the 19th century However, in the 20th century, in the 21st century now, nothing of science has disproven an existence of some form of God. Mm -hmm. well, uh, let's talk about Einstein a minute because, uh, you know, a lot of people, I would say both sides of, of this uh, debate point to Einstein. Uh, religious people take comfort in Einstein. They, they believe he was a believer. And then uh, some of the atheists point to Einstein and say, no, he rejected uh, religion. So you've written a beautiful chapter on him and concluded that he was a spiritual man. Can you kind of review that thesis? Right. Um, so Einstein left us a big mystery because he said some things that would imply that he was an atheist and some things that implied that he was a believer. And I think there are doctoral dissertations still <laughs> waiting to be yes. written. It's, it's not clear, but I, in, in, in this book, I go to all the statements he has made about God, uh, and Einstein talked about God all the time. So if he was an atheist, he was an atheist who was obsessed with God. He said things like, subtle is the Lord, but malicious is not. Um, God doesn't. I shall never believe that God plays dice with the universe, with the world. Um, uh, he said, "I want to know God's thoughts. The rest are details." Mm -hmm. And in one, I, I did a lot of research on Einstein. One of the letters that I translated before other scholars and the general public got to see it, I translated it with the help of my father, who who was very who was German, who had won him awards. Um, he, he said, uh, it's too bad God didn't give us a bigger planet than Jupiter. And he was looking for proof of relativity but through the bending of light. And he, he and an astronomer by the name of Freundlich were looking at, at um, possibilities of finding um, the warping of space time through because of gravity, which is what general relativity teaches us. Uh, or he, he wasn't successful because Jupiter isn't large enough and uh, his theory of relativity was proven uh, five years later in 1919 by Arthur Eddington during a total solar eclipse by looking at starlight that just grazes the sun. The sun is hidden during an eclipse, so it can be seen. The starlight behind it can be seen. And the, the deflection of, of this light away from where it should be uh, was in the amount that Einstein's relativity was proven. Uh, then Einstein became the Einstein we know. Mm -hmm. He became the celebrity right in 1919 when, when the discovery by Eddington was made. So Einstein always talked about God, and in fact in German it sounds even more uh, religious. Um, it was Der Herr Gott, the, the Lord God. And um, he actually, I, there's a letter to a little girl he was, uh, that he wrote that I'm quoting in my book, where he says uh, things about spirituality that if you look at nature, you um, uh, to, to paraphrase him, you are awed by nature, and spirituality certainly has uh, has a place. Um, what I think is that he believed in a more abstract God. He didn't like organ he didn't like organized religions very much, but he believed in 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 the God of nature, the God that created the universe and created the laws of physics, which he, Einstein, was on a, on a life's quest to, to uncover. I remember Carl Sagan, the great astronomer, said that uh, he believed that God was the sum total laws of the universe. That's probably very close to what Einstein believed, the sum total of all these strange laws of quantum mechanics and, uh, and relativity and, and all this intricate mathematics that's needed to 
to explain nature. I was just thinking about the other day, uh, in, in thinking about arguments for the existence of God from science. So we, we live in a world where we really think of things as being continuous. You you move your hand and it's continuous line or space and time are continuous. So why is it that when... Uh, th- th- there's another scientist who was a very good friend of Einstein, Planck, and Planck looked at lines of uh, spectral lines from light uh, and... and black body radiation is what it's called and he noticed that in order to explain them he had to have these jumps these are quantum jumps it's as if nature or god created these jumps in the continuity of space it just in order to create matter because matter wouldn't work if you had a continuity in energy levels all the electrons would fall right into the nuclei and, and, and disappear, and there'll be no matter. The only way to create matter as we know it is to dictate quantum laws that tell the electron, you, can, you have to stay in this orbit. If you go to another orb, orbit, it has to be quantized, meaning there has to be a jump to mm-hmm. the next level. You can't just jump down all the way to the, to, the, uh, to the nucleus. And that tells me that some laws had to be designed for life. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Wow, what a beautiful example. <laughs> Thanks. I just thought <laughs> it <up> yesterday <laughs> while walking down the street. So it's your, it'll be your, your addendum to the book. <laughs> right. What, is, is this the same plank that they got the plank length from? Um, the, the plank... I, uh, there's a measurement. A, there's a measurement oh, called yes, the plank yes, length. Oh, yes, plank time, plank time, plank... Uh. Uh, 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 Planck energy, mm-hmm. yes, the Planck is, is everywhere in quantum mechanics. He, he was the first, he was actually very, he was a classical physicist. He was mm-hmm. raised in the laws of physics the way they are, you know, in the 19th century. And in 1900, just as the century turned, he discovered that there is something that doesn't follow these laws. So he, but, but he was baffled. He didn't want to believe it. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a f- very interesting man. And uh, he was quite old by that time. He was not a very young scientist. And, and, he, and once he discovered these quantum leaps, uh, 25, year, uh, 25 years later, in 1925, 1926, Schrodinger and Heisenberg, and later Dirac, uh, Born, and several others, uh, created the quantum theory, which is based on these quantum leaps that he discovered, but goes much, much deeper. When the quantum world, you can be here and there at the same time, mm-hmm. and you interfere with yourself, uh, and mm-hmm. uh, you have entanglement. Something happens here, and and the same thing happens miles away, instantaneously. These are things that Einstein actually fought against. And he said, I, I, I'll never believe that God plays, plays dice with the universe. And the reason he said that is that quantum mechanics, the quantum theory, is based on probabilities. Now, that's our understanding of what happens in the quantum world. We use probabilities. Is it really probabilistic? We don't know. We don't really understand what happens at the quantum level. In fact... Um, Richard Feynman, the famous American yes. physicist, uh, famously said, uh, "If you think you believe, if, if you think you believe quantum mechanics, you don't. It, I'm sorry. If you think you understand quantum mechanics, then you don't understand quantum mechanics. <laughs> it's 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 a weird mm. theory, and it all started with these quantum mm. leaps that that Planck discovered." That's one of my favorite books of all time is Feynman's uh, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. Just, Mine too. Uh, just, just great, a great splendid book. book. Really. I don't have much of a background in, in mathematics, uh, but I, someone gave me a book some years ago. I think it's called Flatlanders. Right. That's a classic book. Mm-hmm. That's a really classic book about dimensions. But, but it shows you that uh, if you live in two dimensions, mm-hmm. you have no perception of the third dimension. And therefore, by analogy, we live in three-dimensional space, we can't perceive in our everyday lives, at least. Uh, we can't perceive a four-dimensional universe. Um, and that was, I think, the point of that book. So as um, you were talking about uh, walking down the street and having your epiphany <laughs> uh, yesterday or the day before, I uh, was thinking of, of Flatlanders because I used to I used to consider that as a possibility in this debate, saying, well, maybe we are confined to dimensions that keeps us from seeing and perceiving um, uh, the reality of God that, uh, that other people take by faith. 
Right, that's a really good point, and it goes to um, Plato's uh, analogy of the cave, mm-hmm. too, which I know you are, you're yes. well aware of. Um, where I, I'm trying to remember the story, there are these prisoners in a cave, and they're trying to understand life outside the cave by shadows mm-hmm. that they see on the wall of the cave. Exactly. And that's how quantum theory is being described. We're really seeing shadows on the wall, and we try to understand them by probabilities or by other means. And um, well, that's uh, it's pretty much the same idea that um, you just uh, brought up in terms of uh, flatland. Uh, you, on, on flatland, you see shadows of things in the third dimension. Mm-hmm. You don't see the actual objects, and God may well be one of these. Do you think that we will achieve time travel one day? That's a really good question. I once was um, thinking of writing a book with a physicist at the University of Connecticut by the name of Ro- Ronald Mallet, who claimed to build to have built a time machine. And I spent a lot of time together with him. And um, it turned out that um, his ideas were not quite right. The, there's something um, that physicists call the arrow of time. And the theory is that the laws of physics should be reversible. It's like playing a movie forward or backwards should be the same with all the law of physics except for the second law of thermodynamics. So in the second law of thermodynamics talks about <coughs> excuse me about the randomness and and the increase in randomness uh, in, in the universe that's called entropy. And uh, if you throw an egg on the floor, that movie can't be played backwards very nicely. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We don't see, uh, we can't see. If you think of a particle moving left or a car driving forward, it can drive backward um, and so on. So many things can go backwards Mm -hmm. so they can go backwards in time. But if you throw an egg on the floor and it, it splashes and breaks and splashes all over the floor, Um, try to play that movie backwards and what you see is unnatural. You'll never see an egg just forming back into and the shell closing on itself and it Mm -hmm. leaps back up on the table. Mm -hmm. That's because of the second law of thermodynamics. The entropy of the the egg on the floor is much larger than the entropy of the egg before it cracked, before it broke. And therefore... Because entropy always grows in the universe, at least in, in, in a large system, entropy tends to grow. Maybe there are patches of the universe where entropy doesn't. That, that, that's a deep philosophical question that mm, Roger Penrose actually goes into in his books. Um, so because of the increase in entropy, it's hard to, to imagine time travel. Kurt Gödel, the great logician, who was at the um, uh, lived his final years at, at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton and was a good friend of Einstein. Uh, solved some of uh, solved Einstein's equations for a universe that's rotating and not expanding, and he proved you could have time travel in such a universe. Um, mm-hmm. People can look it up; it's an interesting theory. Oh. But um, so you're gonna our do- universe is, is expanding. So you're thinking of, of writing a book about that soon? About no, I dropped that, that. That was a topic <laughs> I was interested in a few years ago, mm-hmm. together with this physicist who was convinced he could build a time machine. But I became convinced that it's not possible. And, uh, well, it, it's, it's easy to become convinced that it's not possible. When I think about time travel, and I think about it often, you know, people who are interested in physics and in mathematics often think about these things. I, I, I stop the minute I think, what will happen to my daughter? Would she not exist anymore or what? You know, if I move back 20-odd years, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't want that to happen. So um, I think, uh, you know, when you think about your children or you even think about the newborn baby, and you, if, if you want to move back even a year, that that little person would not exist anymore. So um, 
there, there, and and of course there are paradoxes that they have to do with things like that. I mean, if if you could travel back in time, you could inadvertently kill your grandfather mm-hmm. or prevent your grandfather from meeting your grandmother, and then you, do you exist or you don't exist? It's a paradox. You exist because you came there from the from the future, but you don't exist because you just destroyed the connection between your grandfather and grandmother. So time <laughs> travel is uh, is is very very difficult to imagine because of many different things. Well, I think you should write that, but unfortunately, we're out of time in the present time. <laughs> so, uh, it's been a delightful conversation, Dr. Uh-huh. Excel. Uh, again, uh, the book is Why Science Does Not Disprove God. It's a splendid read, and I'm sure it's going to be uh, on the bestseller list um, uh, very soon. It's going to stay there a while because it uh, has a lot to say about this debate that's been going on for, well, for a millennium, really, but uh, really been heated up in the last decade. So thank you, Dr. Excel. Thank you. And thank you to audiobooks.com, our underwriter. Remember, at audiobooks.com, your first book is free. I'm Dr. W.F. Strong, signing off for Good Books Radio. Thank you.